The Hero, a novel by Somerset Maugham, Part 4, 16. The tension between James and his parents became not less, but greater. That barrier which, almost from the beginning, they had watched with pain rise up between them, now seemed indestructible, and all their efforts only made it more obvious and more stable. It was like some tropical plant which, for being cut down, grew ever with greater luxuriance. And there was a mischievous devil present at all their conversations that made them misunderstand one another as completely as though they spoke in different tongues. Notwithstanding their love, they were like strangers together. They could look at nothing from the same point of view. The Parsons had lived their whole lives in an artificial state. Ill-educated as most of their contemporaries in that particular class, they had just enough knowledge to render them dogmatic and intolerant. It requires a good deal of information to discover one's own ignorance, but to the consciousness of this, the good people had never arrived. They felt they knew as much as necessary, and naturally on the most debatable questions were most assured. Their standpoint was inconceivably narrow. They had the best intentions in the world of doing their duty, but what their duty was, they accepted on trust, frivolously. They walked round and round in a narrow circle, hemmed in by false ideals and by ugly prejudices, putting for the love of God unnecessary obstacles in their path, and convinced that theirs was the only possible way, while all others led to damnation. They had never worked out an idea for themselves, never done a single deed on their own account, but invariably acted and thought according to the rule of their caste. They were not living creatures, but dogmatic machines. James, going into the world, quickly realized that he had been brought up to a state of things which did not exist. He was like a sailor who has put out to sea in an ornamental boat and finds that his sail is useless, the ropes not made to work, and the rudder immovable. The long, buoyant wind of the world blew away like thistledown the conventions which had seemed so secure a foundation. But he discovered in himself a wonderful curiosity, an eagerness for adventure which led him boldly to affront every peril and the unknown lands of the intellect are every bit as dangerously fascinating as are those of sober fact. He read omnivorously, saw many and varied things. The universe was spread out before him like an enthralling play. Knowledge is like the root of a tree, attaching man by its tendrils to the life about him. James found in existence new beauties, new interests, new complexities, and he gained a lighter heart and, above all, an exquisite sense of freedom. At length he looked back with something like horror at that old life in which the fetters of ignorance had weighed so terribly upon him. On his return to Little Primpton he found his people as he had left them, doing the same things, repeating at every well-known juncture the same trite observations. Their ingenuousness affected him as a negro, civilized and educated, on visiting after many years his native tribe, might be affected by their nose rings and yellow ochre. James was astounded that they should ignore matters which he fancied common knowledge, and at the same time accept beliefs that he had thought completely dead. He was willing enough to shrug his shoulders and humor their prejudices, but they had made of them a rule of life which governed every action with an iron tyranny. It was in accordance with all these outworn conventions that they conducted the daily round. And presently, James found that his father and mother were striving to draw him back into the prison. Unconsciously, even with the greatest tenderness, they sought to place upon his neck again that irksome yoke which he had so difficultly thrown off. If James had learnt anything, it was at all hazards to think for himself, accepting nothing on authority, questioning, doubting. It was to look upon life with a critical eye, trying to understand it and to receive no ready-made explanations. Above all, he had learnt that every question has two sides. Now this was precisely what Colonel Parsons and his wife could never acknowledge. For them, 
one view was certainly right and the other as certainly wrong. There was no middle way. To doubt what they believed could only be ascribed to arrant folly or to wickedness. Sometimes James was thrown into a blind rage by the complacency with which from the depths of his nescience his father dogmatized. No man could have been more unassuming than he, and yet on just the points which were most uncertain, his attitude was almost inconceivably arrogant. And James was horrified at the pettiness and the prejudice which he found in his home. Reading no books, for they thought it waste of time to read, the minds of his father and mother had sunk into such a narrow sluggishness that they could interest themselves only in trivialities. Their thoughts were occupied by their neighbours and the humdrum details of the life about them. Flattering themselves on their ideals and their high principles, they vegetated in stupid sloth and in a less than animal vacuity. Every topic of conversation above the most commonplace they found dull or incomprehensible. James learned that he had to talk to them almost as if they were children, and the tedium of those endless days was intolerable. Occasionally he was exasperated that he could not avoid the discussions which his father, with a weak man's obstinacy, forced upon him. Some unhappy, baneful power seemed to drive Colonel Parsons to widen the rift, the existence of which caused him such exquisite pain. His natural kindliness was obscured by an uncontrollable irritation. One day he was reading the paper. I see we've had another unfortunate reverse, he said, looking up. Oh, I suppose you're delighted, Jamie. I'm very sorry. Why should I be otherwise? You always stick up for the enemies of your country. Turning to his brother-in-law, he explained, James says that if he'd been a Cape Dutchman, he'd have fought against us. Well, he deserves to be court-martialed for saying so, cried Major Forsyth. I don't think he means to be taken seriously, said his mother. Oh, yes, I do. It constantly annoyed James that when he said anything that was not quite an obvious truism, they should think he was speaking merely for effect. Why, my dear mother, if you'd been a Boer woman, you'd have potted at us from behind a haystack with the best of them. The Boers are robbers and brigands. That's just what they say we are. But we're right. And they're equally convinced that they are. God can't be on both sides, James. The odd thing is, the certainty with which both sides claim his exclusive protection. I should think it wicked to doubt that God is with us in a righteous war, said Mrs. Parsons. If the Boers weren't deceived by that old villain Kruger, they'd never have fought us. The Boers are strange people, replied James. They actually prefer their independence to all the privileges and advantages of subjection. The wonderful thing to me is that people should really think Mr. Kruger a hypocrite. A ruler who didn't honestly believe in himself and in his mission would never have had such influence. If a man wants power, he must have self-faith, but then he may be narrow, intolerant, and vicious. His fellows will be like wax in his hands. If Kruger had been honest, he wouldn't have put up with bribery and corruption. The last thing I expect is consistency in an animal of such contrary instincts as man. Every true Englishman, I'm thankful to say, thinks him a scoundrel and a blackguard. In a hundred years, he will probably think him a patriot and a hero. In that time, the sentimental view will be the only one of interest, and the sentimental view will put the Transvaal in the same category as Poland. You're nothing better than a pro-Boer, James. I'm nothing of the kind, but seeing how conflicting was current opinion, I took some trouble to find for myself a justification of the war. I couldn't help wondering why I went and killed people to whom I was personally quite indifferent. I hope because it was your duty as an officer of Her Majesty the Queen. Not exactly. I came to the conclusion that I killed people because I liked it. The fighting instinct is in my blood, and I'm never so happy as when I'm shooting things. Killing tigers is very good sport, but it's not in it with killing men.
That is my justification, so far as I personally am concerned. As a member of society, I wage war for a different reason. War is the natural instinct of all creatures. Not only do progress and civilization arise from it, but it is the very condition of existence. Men, beasts, and plants are all in the same position. Unless they fight incessantly, they're wiped out. There's no sitting on one side and looking on. When a state wants a neighbor's land, it has a perfect right to take it, if it can. Success is its justification. We English wanted the Transvaal for our greater numbers, for our trade, for the continuance of our power. That was our right to take it. The only thing that seems to me undignified is the rather pitiful set of excuses we made up. If those are your ideas, I think they are utterly ignoble. I believe they're scientific. Do you think men go to war for scientific reasons? No, of course not. They don't realize them. The great majority are incapable of abstract ideas, but fortunately they're emotional and sentimental, and the pill can be gilded with highfalutin. It's for them that the Union Jack and the honor of Old England are dragged through every newspaper and brandished in every music hall. It's for them that all these atrocities are invented, most of them bunkum. Men are only savages with a thin veneer of civilization, which is rather easily rubbed off, and then they act just like Red Indians. But as a general rule, they're well enough behaved. The Boer isn't a bad sort, and the Englishman isn't a bad sort, but there's not room for both of them on the earth, and one of them has to go. My father fought for duty and honor's sake, and so fought his father before him. Men have always fought really for the same reasons, for self-protection and gain, but perhaps they have not seen quite so clearly as now the truth behind all their big words. The world and mankind haven't altered suddenly in the last few years. Afterwards, when Colonel Parsons and his wife were alone together, and she saw that he was brooding over his son's words, she laid her hand on his shoulder and said, Don't worry, Richmond. It'll come right in the end, if we trust and pray. I don't know what to make of him, he returned, sadly shaking his head. It's not our boy, Francis. He couldn't be callous and unscrupulous and dishonorable. God forgive me for saying it. Don't be hard on him, Richmond. I dare say he doesn't mean all he says, and remember that he's been very ill. He's not himself yet. The colonel sighed bitterly. When we looked forward so anxiously to his return, we didn't know that he would be like this. James had gone out. He wandered along the silent roads, taking in large breaths of the fresh air, for his home affected him like a hothouse. The atmosphere was close and heavy, so that he could neither think freely nor see things in any reasonable light. He felt sometimes as though a weight were placed upon his head that pressed him down, and pressed him down, till he seemed almost forced to his knees. He blamed himself for his lack of moderation. Why, remembering ever his father's unhappiness and his infirmities, could he not humour him? He was an old man, weak and frail. It should not have been so difficult to use restraint towards him. James knew he had left them in Primpton House distressed and angry, but the only way to please them was to surrender his whole personality, giving up to their bidding all his thoughts and all his actions. They wished to exercise over him the most intolerable of all tyrannies, the tyranny of love. It was a heavy return they demanded for their affection if he must abandon his freedom, body, and soul. He earnestly wished to make them happy, but that was too hard a price to pay. And then, with sudden rage, James asked himself why they should be so self-sufficiently certain that they were right. What an outrageous assumption it was that age must be infallible. Their idea of filial duty was that he should accept their authority, not because they were wise, but because they were old. When he was a child, they had insisted on the utmost submission, and now they expected the same submission to their prejudice, intolerance, and lack of knowledge. 
they had almost ridiculously that calm, quiet, well-satisfied assurance which a king by right divine might have in the certainty that he could do no wrong. And James, with bitter, painful scorn, thought of that frightful blunder which had forced Colonel Parsons to leave the service. At first, his belief in his father had been such that James could not conceive the possibility even that he had acted wrongly. The mere fact that his father had chosen a certain course was proof of its being right and proper, and the shame lay with his chief, who had used him ill. But when he examined the affair and thought over it, the truth became only too clear. It came to him like a blow, and for a while he was overcome with shame. The fact was evident, alas, only too evident, his father was incapable of command. James was simply astounded. He tried not to hear the cruel words that buzzed in his ears, but he could not help it. Imbecility, crass idiocy, madness. It was worse than madness, the folly of it was almost criminal. He thought now that his father had escaped very easily. James hastened his step, trying to rid himself of the irritating thoughts. He walked along the fat and fertile Kentish fields, by the neat iron railing with which they were enclosed. All about him was visible the care of man. Nothing was left wild. The trees were lopped into proper shape, cut down where their presence seemed inelegant, planted to complete the symmetry of a group. Nature herself was under the power of the formal influence and flourished with a certain rigidity and decorum. After a while, the impression became singularly irksome. It seemed to emphasize man's lack of freedom, reminding one of the iron conventions with which he is inevitably bound. In the sun, the valley, all green and wooded, was pleasantly cool. But when the clouds rolled up from the west heavily, brushing the surrounding hills, the aspect was so circumscribed that James could have cried out as with physical pain. The primness of the scene, then, was insufferable. The sombre, well-ordered elms, the meadows so carefully kept, seemed the garden of some great voluptuous prison, and the air was close with servitude. James panted for breath. He thought of the vast distances of South Africa, bush and prairie stretching illimitably, and above, the blue sky, vaster still. There, at least, one could breathe freely and stretch one's limbs. Why did I ever come back? he cried. The blood went thrilling through his veins at the mere thought of those days in which every minute had been intensely worth living. Then, indeed, was no restraint or pettiness. Then men were hard and firm and strong. By comparison, people in England appeared so pitifully weak, vain, paltry, insignificant. What were the privations and the hardships beside the sense of mastery, the happy adventure, and the carelessness of life? But the grey clouds hung over the valley, pregnant with rain. It gave him a singular feeling of discomfort to see them laden with water and yet painfully holding it up. I can't stay in this place, he muttered. I shall go mad. A sudden desire for flight seized him. The clouds sank lower and lower till he imagined he must bend his head to avoid them. If he could only get away for a little, he might regain his calm. At least absence, he thought bitterly, was the only way to restore the old affection between him and his father. He went home and announced that he was going to London. Seventeen. After the quiet of Little Primpton, the hurry and the noise of Victoria were a singular relief to James. Waiting for his luggage, he watched the various movements of the scene, the trolleys pushed along with warning cries, the porters lifting heavy packages onto the bellied roof of hansoms, the people running to and fro, the crowd of cabs. And driving out, he was exhilarated by the confusion in the station yard, and the intense life, half gay, half sordid, of the Wilton Road. He took a room in Jermyn Street, according to Major Forsyth's recommendation, and walked to his club. James had been out of London so long that he came back with the emotions of a stranger, common scenes, 
The glitter of shops, the turmoil of the circus, affected him with pleased surprise, and with a child's amusement, he paused to stare at the advertisements on a hoarding. He looked forward to seeing old friends, and on his way down Piccadilly, even expected to meet one or two of them sauntering along. As a matter of form, James asked at his club whether there were any letters for him. I don't think so, sir, said the porter, but turned to the pigeonholes and took out a bundle. He looked them over and then handed one to James. Hello, who's this from? Suddenly something gripped his heart. He felt the blood rush to his cheeks and a cold tremor ran through all his limbs. He recognised the handwriting of Mrs. Pritchard Wallace and there was a penny stamp on the envelope. She was in England. The letter had been posted in London. He turned away and walked towards a table that stood near the window of the hall. A thousand recollections surged across his memory tumultuously. The paper was scented. How characteristic that was of her, and in what bad taste. He saw at once her smile and the look of her eyes. He had a mad desire passionately to kiss the letter. A load of weariness fell from his heart. He felt insanely happy, as though angry storm clouds had been torn asunder and the sun in its golden majesty shone calmly upon the earth. Then, with sudden impulse, he tore the unopened letter into a dozen pieces and threw them away. He straightened himself and walked into the smoking room. James looked round and saw nobody he knew, quietly took a magazine from the table and sat down. But the blood vessels in his brain throbbed so violently that he thought something horrible would happen to him. He heard the regular, quick beating like the implacable hammering of gnomes upon some hidden, distant anvil. She's in London, he repeated. When had the letter been posted? At least he might have looked at the mark on the envelope. Was it a year ago? Was it lately? The letter did not look as though it had been lying about the club for many months. Had it not still the odour of those dreadful Palmer violets? She must have seen in the paper his return from Africa, wounded and ill. And what did she say? Did she merely write a few cold words of congratulation, or more? It was terrible that after three years the mere sight of her handwriting should have power to throw him into this state of eager, passionate anguish. He was seized with the old panic, the terrified perception of his surrender, of his utter weakness, which made flight the only possible resistance. That was why he had destroyed the letter unread. When Mrs. Wallace was many thousand miles away, there had been no danger in confessing that he loved her. But now it was different. What did she say in the letter? Had she in some feminine, mysterious fashion discovered his secret? Did she ask him to go and see her? James remembered one of their conversations. Oh, I love going to London, she had cried, opening her arms with the charming exotic gesticulation which distinguished her from all other women. I enjoy myself awfully. What do you do? Everything. And I write to poor Dick three times a week and tell him all I haven't done. I can't bear the grass widow, said James. Poor boy, you can't bear anything that's amusing. I never knew anyone with such an ideal of woman as you have, a gloomy mixture of frumpishness and angularity. James did not answer. Don't you wish we were in London now? She went on. You and I together? I really believe I should have to take you about. You're as innocent as a babe. Do you think so? said James, rather hurt. Now, if we were in town, on our own, what would you do? Oh, I don't know. I suppose make a little party and dine somewhere and go to the Savoy to see the Mikado. Mrs. Wallace laughed. I know, a party of four, yourself and me, and two maiden aunts, and we should be very prim, and talk about the weather, and go in a growler for propriety's sake. I know that sort of evening, and after the maiden aunts had seen me safety home, I should simply howl from boredom. My dear boy, I'm respectable enough here. When I'm on my own, I want to go on the loose. Now I'll tell you what I want to do if ever we are in town together. 
Will you promise to do it? If I possibly can. All right. Well, you shall fetch me in the fastest hansom you can find, and remember to tell the driver to go as quick as ever he dare. We'll dine alone, please, at the most expensive restaurant in London. You'll engage a table in the middle of the room, and you must see that the people all round us are very smart and very shady. It always makes me feel so virtuous to look at disreputable women. Do I shock you? Not more than usual. How absurd you are. Then we'll go to the Empire, and after that we'll go somewhere else and have supper where the people are still smarter and still shadier. And then we'll go to Covent Garden Ball. Oh, you don't know how I long to go on the rampage sometimes. I get so tired of propriety. And what will P.W. say to all this? Oh, I'll write and tell him that I spent the evening with some of his poor relations and give eight pages of corroborative evidence. James thought of Pritchard Wallace, gentlest and best humoured of men. He was a great big fellow with a heavy moustache and kind eyes, always ready to stand by anyone in difficulties, always ready with comfort or with cheery advice. Whoever wanted help went to him as though it were the most natural thing in the world. And it was touching to see the dog-like devotion to his wife. He had such confidence in her that he never noticed her numerous flirtations. Pritchard Wallace thought himself rather a dull stick, and he wanted her to amuse herself. So brilliant a creature could not be expected to find sufficient entertainment in a quiet man of easy-going habits. Go your own way, my girl, he said. I know you're all right, and so long as you keep a place for me in the bottom of your heart, you can do whatever you like. Now, of course, I don't care two straws for anyone but you, silly old thing. And she pulled his moustache and kissed his lips, and he went off on his business, his heart swelling with gratitude because Providence had given him the enduring love of so beautiful and enchanting a little woman. P.W. is worth ten of you, James told her indignantly one day, when he had been witness to some audacious deception. Well, he doesn't think so, and that's the chief thing. James dared not see her. It was obviously best to have destroyed the letter. After all, it was probably nothing more than a curt, formal congratulation, and its coldness would nearly have broken his heart. He feared also, lest in his never-ceasing thought he had crystallized his beloved into something quite different from reality. His imagination was very active, and its constant play upon those few recollections might easily have added many a false delight. To meet Mrs. Wallace would only bring perhaps a painful disillusion, and of that James was terrified for without this passion which occupied his whole soul, he would be now singularly alone in the world. It was a fantastic, charming figure that he had made for himself, and he could worship it without danger and without reproach. Was it not better to preserve his dream from the sullen eruption of fact? But why would that perfume come perpetually entangling itself with his memory? It gave the image new substance and when he closed his eyes, the woman seemed so near that he could feel against his face the fragrance of her breath. He dined alone, and spent the hours that followed in reading. By some chance, he was able to find no one he knew, and he felt rather bored. He went to bed with a headache, feeling already the dreariness of London without friends. Next morning, James wandered in the park, fresh and delightful with the rhododendrons, but the people he saw hurt him by their almost aggressive happiness. Vivacious, cheerful, and careless, they were all evidently of opinion that no reasonable creature could complain with the best of all possible worlds. The girls that hurried past on ponies or on bicycles up and down the well-kept road gave him an impression of light-heartedness which was fascinating yet made his own solitude more intolerable. Their cheeks glowed with healthiness in the summer air, and their gestures, their laughter, were charmingly animated. He noticed the smile which a slender Amazon gave to a man who raised his hat and read suddenly in their eyes 
a happy, successful tenderness. Once, galloping towards him, he saw a woman who resembled Mrs. Wallace, and his heart stood still. He had an intense longing to behold her just once more, unseen of her, but he was mistaken. The rider approached and passed, and it was no one he knew. Then, tired and sore at heart, James went back to his club. The day passed monotonously, and the day after he was seized by the peculiar discomfort of the lonely sojourner in great cities. The thronging, busy crowd added to his solitariness. When he saw acquaintances address one another in the club, or walk along the streets in conversation, he could hardly bear his own friendlessness. The interests of all these people seemed so fixed and circumscribed, their lives were already so full that they could only look upon a newcomer with hostility. He would have felt less lonely on a desert island than in the multitudinous city, surrounded by hurrying strangers. He scarcely knew how he managed to drag through the day, tired of the eternal smoking-room, tired of wandering about. The lodgings which Major Forsyth had recommended were like barracks, a tall, narrow house in which James had a room at the top looking on to a blank wall. They were dreadfully cheerless and as James climbed the endless stairs, he felt an irritation at the joyous laughter that came from other rooms. Behind those closed, forbidding doors, people were happy and light of heart. Only he was alone, and must remain perpetually imprisoned within himself. He went to the theatre, but here again, half insanely, he felt a barrier between himself and the rest of the audience. For him, the piece offered no illusions. He could only see painted actors strutting affectedly in unnatural costumes. The scenery was mere painted cloth, and the dialogue senseless inanity. With all his might, James wished that he were again in Africa, with work to do and danger to encounter. There the solitude was never lonely, and the nights were blue and silent, rich with the countless stars. He had been in London a week. One day, towards evening, while he walked down Piccadilly, looking aimlessly at the people and asking himself what their inmost thoughts could be, he felt a hand on his shoulder and a cheery voice called out his name. I knew it was you, Parsons. Where the devil have you sprung from? He turned round and saw a man he had known in India. Jamie's solitude and boredom had made him almost effusive. By Jove, I am glad to see you, he said, wringing the fellow's hand. Come and have a drink. I've seen no one for days, and I'm dying to have someone to talk to. I think I can manage it. I've got a train to catch at eight. I'm just off to Scotland. Jamie's face fell. I was going to ask you to dine with me. I'm awfully sorry, I'm afraid I can't. They talked of one thing and another, till Jamie's friend said he must go immediately. They shook hands. Oh, by the way, said the man, suddenly remembering, I saw a pal of yours the other day who's clamoring for you. For me? James reddened, knowing at once, instinctively, that it could only be one person. Do you remember Mrs. Pritchard Wallace? She's in London. I saw her at a party and she asked me if I knew anything about you. She's staying in Half Moon Street at 201. You'd better go and see her. Goodbye. I must simply bolt. He left James hurriedly and did not notice the effect of his few words. She still thought of him. She asked for him. She wished him to go to her. The gods in their mercy had sent him the address. With beating heart and joyful step, James immediately set out. The throng in his way vanished, and he felt himself walking along some roadway of ethereal fire straight to his passionate love, a roadway miraculously fashioned for his feet, leading only to her. Every thought left him, but that the woman he adored was waiting, waiting, ready to welcome him with that exquisite smile, with the hands which were like the caresses of Aphrodite, turned to visible flesh. But he stopped short. What's the good? he cried bitterly. Before him the sun was setting like a vision of love, colouring with softness 
and with quiet the manifold life of the city. James looked at it, his heart swelling with sadness, for with it seemed to die his short joy, and the shadows lengthening were like the sad facts of reality which crept into his soul one by one silently. I won't go, he cried. I daren't. Oh, God help me, and give me strength. He turned into the green park, where lovers sat entwined upon the benches, and in the pleasant warmth the idlers and the weary slept upon the grass. James sank heavily upon a seat and gave himself over to his wretchedness. The night fell, and the lamps upon Piccadilly were lit, and in the increasing silence the roar of London sounded more intensely. From the darkness, as if it were the scene of a play, James watched the cabs and buses pass rapidly in the light, the endless procession of people like disembodied souls drifting aimlessly before the wind. It was a comfort and a relief to sit there unseen, under cover of the night. He observed the turmoil with a new, disinterested curiosity, feeling strangely as if he were no longer among the living. He found himself surprised that they thought it worthwhile to hurry and to trouble. The couples on the benches remained in silent ecstasy, and sometimes a dark figure slouched past sorrowful and mysterious. At last James went out, surprised to find it was so late. The theatres had disgorged their crowds, and Piccadilly was thronged, gay, vivacious, and insouciant. For a moment there was a certain luxury about its vice. The harlot gained the pompousness of a Roman courtesan, and the vulgar debauchee had for a little while the rich, corrupt decadence of art and splendour. James turned into Half Moon Street, which now was all deserted and silent, and walked slowly, with anguish tearing at his heart, towards the house in which lodged Mrs. Wallace. One window was still lit, and he wondered whether it was hers. It would have been an exquisite pleasure if he could, but have seen her form pass the drawn blind. Ah, he could not have mistaken it. Presently the light was put out, and the whole house was in darkness. He waited on, for no reason, pleased to be near her. He waited half the night, till he was so tired he could scarcely drag himself home. In the morning James was ill and tired and disillusioned. His head ached, so that he could hardly bear the pain, and in all his limbs he felt a strange and heavy lassitude. He wondered why he had troubled himself about the woman who cared nothing, nothing whatever for him. He repeated about her the bitter, scornful things he had said so often. He fancied he had suddenly grown indifferent. I shall go back to Primpton, he said. London is too horrible. 18. The lassitude and the headache explained themselves, for the day after Jamie's arrival at Little Primpton he fell ill, and the doctor announced that he had enteric fever. He explained that it was not uncommon for persons to develop the disease after their return from the Cape. In their distress, the first thought of Mrs. Parsons and the Colonel was to send for Mary. They knew her to be quick and resourceful. Dr. Radley says we must have a nurse down. Jamie is never to be left alone, and I couldn't manage by myself. Mary hesitated and reddened. Oh, I wish Jamie would let me nurse him. You and I could do everything much better than a strange woman. Do you think he'd mind? Mrs. Parsons looked at her doubtfully. It's very kind of you, Mary. I'm afraid he's not treated you so as to deserve that, and it would exhaust you dreadfully. I'm very strong. I should like it so much. Won't you ask Jamie? He can only refuse. Very well. Mrs. Parsons went up to her son, by whom sat the colonel, looking at him wistfully. James lay on his back, breathing quickly, dull, listless, and apathetic. Every now and then his dark, dry lips contracted as the unceasing pain of his head became suddenly almost insufferable. Jamie, dear, said Mrs. Parsons, Dr. Radley says you must have a second nurse, and we thought of getting one from Tunbridge Wells. Would you mind if Mary came instead?' 
James opened his eyes, bright and unnatural, and the dilated pupils gave them a strangely piercing expression. Does she want to? It would make her very happy. Does she know that Enteric is horrid to nurse? For your sake she will do everything willingly. Then let her. He smiled faintly. It's an ill wind that blows nobody good. That's what the curate said. He had sufficient strength to smile to Mary when she came up, and to stretch out his hand. It's very good of you, Mary. Nonsense, she said, cheerily. You mustn't talk. And you must do whatever I tell you, and let yourself be treated like a little boy. For days James remained in the same condition, with aching head, his face livid in its pallor, except for the bright, the terrifying flush of the cheeks, and the lips were dark with the sickly darkness of death. He lay on his back continually, apathetic and listless, his eyes closed. Now and again he opened them, and their vacant brilliancy was almost unearthly. He seemed to see horrible things, impossible to prevent, staring in front of him with the ghastly intensity of the blind. Meanwhile, Mrs. Parsons and Mary nursed him devotedly. Mary was quite splendid. In her loving quickness she forestalled all Jamie's wants, so that they were satisfied almost before he had realized them. She was always bright and good-tempered and fresh. She performed with constant cheerfulness the little revolting services which the disease necessitates. Nothing was too difficult or too harassing or too unpleasant for her to do. She sacrificed herself with delight, taking upon her shoulders the major part of the work, leaving James only when Mrs. Parsons forced her to rest. She sat up night after night uncomplainingly, having sent for her clothes, and, notwithstanding Mrs. Clibben's protests, taken up her abode altogether at Primpton House. Mrs. Clibben said it was a most improper proceeding, that a trained nurse would be more capable, and the Parsons could well afford it, and also that it was indelicate for Mary to force herself upon James, when he was too ill to defend himself. "'I don't know what we should do without you, Mary,' said Colonel Parsons, with tears in his eyes. If we save him, it will be your doing. Of course we shall save him. All I ask you is to say nothing of what I've done. It's been a pleasure to me to serve him, and I don't deserve, and I don't want gratitude. But it became more than doubtful whether it would be possible to save James, weakened by his wound and by the privations of the campaign. The disease grew worse. He was constantly delirious and his prostration extreme. His cheeks sank in, and he seemed to have lost all power of holding himself together. He lay low down in the bed, as if he had given up trying to save himself. His face became dusky, so that it was terrifying to look upon. The doctor could no longer conceal his anxiety, and at last Mrs. Parsons, alone with him, insisted upon knowing the truth. Is there any chance? she asked tremulously. I would much rather know the worst. I'm afraid very, very little. Mrs. Parsons shook hands silently with Dr. Radley and returned to the sick room, where Mary and the Colonel were sitting at the bedside. Well? Mrs. Parsons bent her head, and the silent tears rolled down her cheeks. The others understood only too well. The Lord's will be done whispered the father, Blessed be the name of the Lord. They looked at James with aching hearts. All their bitterness had long gone, and they loved him again with the old devotion of past time. Do you think I was hard on him, dear? said the colonel. Mary took his hand and held it affectionately. Don't worry about that, she said. I'm sure he never felt any bitterness towards you. James now was comatose, but sometimes a reflex movement would pass through him, a sort of quiver which seemed horribly as though the soul were parting from his body, and feebly he clutched at the bedclothes. Was it for this that he was saved from war and pestilence, muttered the colonel hopelessly, but the fates 
love nothing better than to mock the poor little creatures whose destinies ceaselessly they weave, refusing the wretched heart's desire till long waiting has made it listless, and giving with both hands only when the gift entails destruction. James did not die. The passionate love of those three persons who watched him day by day and night by night seemed to have exercised the might of death. He grew a little better. His vigorous frame battled for life with all the force of that unknown mysterious power which cements into existence the myriad wandering atoms. He was listless, indifferent to the issue, but the will to live fought for him, and he grew better. Quickly he was out of danger. His father and Mary and Mrs. Parsons looked at one another almost with surprise, hardly daring to believe that they had saved him. They had suffered so much, all three of them, that they hesitated to trust their good fortune, superstitiously fearing that if they congratulated themselves too soon, some dreadful thing would happen to plunge back their beloved into deadly danger. But at last he was able to get up, to sit in the garden, now luxuriant with the ripe foliage of August, and they felt the load of anxiety gradually lift itself from their shoulders. They ventured again to laugh and to talk of little trivial things and of the future. They no longer had that panic terror when they looked at him, pale and weak and emaciated. Then again, the old couple thanked Mary for what she had done, and one day, in secret, went off to Tunbridge Wells to buy a little present as a proof of their gratitude. Colonel Parsons suggested a bracelet, but his wife was sure that Mary would prefer something useful, so they brought back with them a very elaborate and expensive writing case, which with a few shy words they presented to her. Mary, poor thing, was overcome with pleasure. It's awfully good of you, she said. I've done nothing that I wouldn't have done for any of the cottagers. We know it was you who saved him. You, you snatched him from the very jaws of death. Mary paused and held out her hand. Will you promise me one thing? What is it? asked Colonel Parsons, unwilling to give his word rashly. Well, promise that you will never tell James that he owes anything to me. I couldn't bear him to think I had forced myself on him so as to have a sort of claim. Please promise me that. I should never be able to keep it, cried the colonel. I think she's right, Richmond. We'll promise, Mary. Besides, James can't help knowing. The hopes of the dear people were reviving, and they began to look upon Jamie's illness, piously, as a blessing of providence in disguise. While Mrs. Parsons was about her household work in the morning, the colonel would sometimes come in, rubbing his hands gleefully. And I've been watching them from the kitchen garden, he said. James lay on a long chair in a sheltered, shady place, and Mary sat beside him, reading aloud or knitting. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Richmond, said his wife with an indulgent smile. It's very cruel. I couldn't help it, my dear. They're sitting there together, just like a pair of turtle doves. Are they talking or reading? She's reading to him and he's looking at her. He never takes his eyes off her. Mrs. Parsons sighed with a happy sadness. God is very good to us, Richmond. James was surprised to find how happily he could spend his days with Mary. He was carried into the garden as soon as he got up and remained there most of the day. Mary, as ever, was untiring in her devotion, thoughtful, anxious to obey his smallest whim. He saw very soon the thoughts which were springing up again in the minds of his father and mother, intercepting the little significant glances which passed between them when Mary went away on some errand, and he told her not to be long, when they exchanged gentle chaff, or she arranged the cushions under his head. The neighbours had asked to visit him, but this he resolutely declined, and appealed to Mary for protection. I'm quite happy alone here with you, and if anyone else comes, I swear I'll fall ill again. And with a little flush of pleasure and a smile, Mary answered that she would tell them all he was very grateful for their sympathy, but didn't feel strong enough to see them. I don't feel a bit grateful, really, he said. Then you ought to, 
Her manner was much gentler now that James was ill, and her rigid moral sense relaxed a little in favour of his weakness. Mary's common sense became less aggressive, and if she was practical and unimaginative as ever, she was less afraid than before of giving way to him. She became almost tolerant, allowing him little petulances and little evasions, petty weaknesses which in complete health she would have felt it her duty not to compromise with. She treated him like a child, with whom it was possible to be indulgent without a surrender of principle. He could still claim to be spoiled and petted and made much of, and James found that he could look forward with something like satisfaction to the condition of things which was evolving. He did not doubt that if he proposed to Mary again, she would accept him, and all their difficulties would be at an end. After all, why not? He was deeply touched by the loving, ceaseless care she had taken of him. Indeed, no words from his father were needed to make him realize what she had gone through. She was kindness itself, tender, considerate, cheerful. He felt an utter prig to hesitate. And now that he had got used to her again, James was really very fond of Mary. In his physical weakness, her strength was peculiarly comforting. He could rely upon her entirely and trust her. He admired her rectitude and her truthfulness. She reminded him of a granite cross standing alone in a desolate Scotch island, steadfast to wind and weather, unyielding even to time, erect and stern, and yet somehow pathetic in its solemn loneliness. Was it a lot of nonsense that he had thought about the immaculacy of the flesh? The world in general found his theories ridiculous or obscene. The world might be right. After all, the majority is not necessarily wrong. Jamie's illness interfered like a blank space between his present self and the old one, with its strenuous ideals of a purity of body which vulgar persons knew nothing of. Weak and ill, dependent upon the strength of others, his former opinions seemed singularly uncertain. How much more easy and comfortable was it to fall back upon the ideas of all and sundry? One cannot help being a little conscience-stricken sometimes when one thinks differently from others. That is why society holds together. Conscience is its most efficient policeman. But when one shares common opinions, the whole authority of civilization backs one up, and the reward is an ineffable self-complacency. It is the easiest thing possible to wallow in the prejudices of all the world, and the most eminently satisfactory. For nineteen hundred years we have learnt that the body is shameful, a pitfall, and a snare to the soul. It is to be hoped we have won, for our bodies, since we began worrying about our souls, leave much to be desired. The common idea is that the flesh is beastly, the spirit divine, and it sounds reasonable enough. If it means little, one need not care, for the world has turned eternally to one senseless formula after another. All one can be sure about is that in the things of this world there is no absolute certainty. James, in his prostration, felt only indifference, and his old strenuousness with its tragic despair seemed not a little ridiculous. His eagerness to keep clean from what he thought prostitution was melodramatic and silly, his idea of purity, mere foolishness. If the body was excrement, as from his youth he had been taught, what could it matter how one used it? Did anything matter when a few years would see the flesh he had thought divine corrupt and worm-eaten? James was willing now to float along the stream sociably with his fellows, and had no doubt that he would soon find a set of high-sounding phrases to justify his degradation. What importance could his actions have, who was an obscure unit in an ephemeral race? It was much better to cease troubling and let things come as they would. People were obviously right when they said that Mary must be an excellent helpmate. How often had he not told himself that she would be all that a wife should, kind, helpful, trustworthy? Was it not enough? And, and his marriage would give such pleasure to his father and mother, such happiness to Mary. If he could make a little return for all her goodness, 
Was he not bound to do so? He smiled with bitter scorn at his dead, lofty ideals. The workaday world was not fit for them. It was much safer and easier to conform oneself to its terrestrial standard. And the amusing part of it was that these new opinions which seemed to him a falling away, to others meant precisely the reverse. They thought it purer and more ethereal that a man should marry because a woman would be a housekeeper of good character than because the divine instincts of nature irresistibly propelled him. James shrugged his shoulders and turned to look at Mary, who was coming towards him with letters in her hand. Three letters for you, Jamie. Whom are they from? Look, she handed him one. That's a bill, I bet, he said. Open it and see. She opened and read out an account for boots. Throw it away. Mary opened her eyes. It must be paid, Jamie. Of course it must, but not for a long time yet. Let him send it in a few times more. Now, the next one. He looked at the envelope and did not recognize the handwriting. You can open that too. It was from the Larches, repeating their invitation to go and see them. Sa I wonder if they're still worrying about the death of their boy. Oh, well, it's six months ago, isn't it? replied Mary. I suppose in that time one gets over most griefs. I must go over some day. Now the third. He reddened slightly, recognizing again the handwriting of Mrs. Wallace. But this time it affected him very little. He was too weak to care, and he felt almost indifferent. Shall I open it? said Mary. James hesitated. No, he said, tear it up. And then in reply to her astonishment, he added, smiling, It's all right. I'm not off my head. Tear it up, and don't ask questions. There's a dear. Of course, I'll tear it up if you want me to, said Mary, looking rather perplexed. Now go to the hedge and throw the pieces in the field. She did so and sat down again. Shall I read to you? No, I'm sick of the antiquary. Why the goodness they can't talk English like rational human beings, heaven only knows. Well, we must finish it now we've begun. Do you think something dreadful will happen to us if we don't? If one begins a book, I think one should finish it, however dull it is. One is sure to get some good out of it. My dear, you're a perfect monster of conscientiousness. Well, if you don't want me to read, I shall go on with my knitting. I don't want you to knit either. I want you to talk to me. Mary looked almost charming in the subdued light of the sun as it broke through the leaves, giving a softness of expression and a richness of colour that James had never seen in her before. And the summer frock she wore made her more girlish and irresponsible than usual. You've been very, very good to me all this time, Mary, said James, suddenly. Mary flushed. I... I can never thank you enough. Nonsense! Your father has been telling you a lot of rubbish, and he promised he wouldn't... No, he said nothing. Did you make him promise? That was very nice and just like you. I was afraid he'd say more than he ought. Do you think I haven't been able to see for myself? I owe my life to you. You owe it to God, Jamie. He smiled and took her hand. I'm very, very grateful. It's been a pleasure to nurse you, Jamie. I never knew you'd make such a good patient. And for all you've done, I've made you wretched and miserable. Can you ever forgive me? There's nothing to forgive, dear. You know I always think of you as a brother. Ah, that's what you told the curate, cried James, laughing. Mary reddened. How do you know? He told Mrs. Jackson and she told Father. You're not angry with me? I think you might have made it second cousin, said James with a smile. Mary did not answer, but tried to withdraw her hand. He held it fast. Mary, I've treated you vilely. If you don't hate me, it's only because you're a perfect angel. Mary looked down, blushing deep red. I can never hate you. 
she whispered. Oh, Mary, can you forgive me? Can you forget? It sounds almost impertinent to ask you again. Will you marry me, Mary? She withdrew her hand. It's very kind of you, Jamie. You're only asking me out of gratitude because I've helped a little to look after you. But I want no gratitude. It was all pleasure. And I'm only too glad that you're getting well. I'm perfectly in earnest, Mary. I wouldn't ask you merely from gratitude. I know I have humiliated you dreadfully, and I have done my best to kill the love you had for me. But I really honestly love you now, with all my heart. If you still care for me a little, I beseech you not to dismiss me. If I still care for you, cried Mary hoarsely, oh my God! Mary, forgive me. I want you to marry me. She looked at him distractedly, the fire burning through her heart. He took both her hands and drew her towards him. Mary, say yes. She sank helplessly to her knees beside him. It would make me very happy, she murmured, with touching humility. Then he bent forward and kissed her tenderly. Let's go and tell them, he said. They'll be so pleased. Mary, smiling and joyful, helped him to his feet, and supporting him as best she could, they went towards the house. Colonel Parsons was sitting in the dining room, twirling his old Panama in a great state of excitement. He had interrupted his wife at her accounts, and she was looking at him good-humouredly over her spectacles. I'm sure something's happening, he said. I went out to take Jamie his beef tea, and he was holding Mary's hand. I coughed as loud as I could, but they took no notice at all, so I thought I'd better not disturb them. Here they come said Mrs. Parsons. Mother, said James, Mary has something to tell you. I haven't anything of the sort, cried Mary, blushing and laughing. Jamie has something to tell you. Well, the fact is, I've asked Mary to marry me, and she said she would. 19. James was vastly relieved. His people's obvious delight, Mary's quiet happiness, were very grateful to him, and if he laughed at himself a little for feeling so virtuous, he could not help thoroughly enjoying the pleasure he had given. He was willing to acknowledge now that his conscience had been uneasy after the rupture of his engagement, although he had assured himself so vehemently that reason was upon his side, the common disapproval and the influence of all his bringing up had affected him in his own despite. When shall we get married, Mary? he asked, when the four of them were sitting together in the garden. Quickly, cried Colonel Parsons. Well, shall we say in a month or six weeks? Do you think you'll be strong enough? replied Mary, looking affectionately at him, and then, blushing a little, I can get ready very soon. The night before she had gone home and taken out the trousseau which with tears had been put away. She smoothed out the things, unfolded them, and carefully folded them up. Never in her life had she possessed such dainty linen. Mary cried a while with pleasure to think that she could begin again to collect her little store. No one knew what agony it had been to write to the shops at Tunbridge Wells countermanding her orders, and now she looked forward with quiet delight to buying all that remained to get. Finally, it was decided that the wedding should take place at the beginning of October. Mrs. Parsons wrote to her brother, who answered that he had expected the event all along, being certain that his conversation with James would eventually bear fruit. He was happy to be able to congratulate himself on the issue of his diplomacy. It was wonderful how easily all difficulties were settled if one took them from the point of view of a man of the world. Mrs. Jackson likewise flattered herself that the renewed engagement was due to her intervention. I saw he was paying attention to what I said, she told her husband. I knew all he wanted was a good, straight talking to. I am sorry for poor Dryland, said the vicar. Yes, I think we ought to do our best to console him. Don't you think he might go away for a month, Archibald? Mr. Dryland came to tea and the vicar's wife surrounded him with little attentions. She put an extra lump of sugar in his tea 
and cut him even a larger piece of seed cake than usual. Of course you've heard, Mr. Dryland, she said solemnly. Are you referring to Miss Clibborn's engagement to Captain Parsons? he asked with a gloomy face. Bad news travels fast. You have all our sympathies. We did everything we could for you. I can't deny that it's a great blow to me. I confess I thought that time and patience on my part might induce Miss Clibborn to change her mind. But if she's happy, I cannot complain. I must bear my misfortune with resignation. But will she be happy? asked Mrs. Jackson, with foreboding in her voice. I sincerely hope so. Anyhow, I think it my duty to go to Captain Parsons and offer him my congratulations. Will you do that, Mr. Dryland? cried Mrs. Jackson. That is noble of you. If you'd like to take your holiday now, Dryland, said the vicar, I dare say we can manage it. Oh, no, thanks. I'm not the man to desert from the field of battle. Mrs. Jackson sighed. Things never come right in this world. That's what I always say. The clergy are continually doing deeds of heroism which the world never hears anything about. The curate went to Primpton House and inquired whether he might see Captain Parsons. I'll go and ask if he's well enough, answered the colonel with his admirable respect for the cloth. Do you think he wants to talk to me about my soul? asked James, smiling. I don't know, but I think you'd better see him. Very well. Mr. Dryland came forward and shook hands with James in an ecclesiastical and suave manner, trying to be dignified as behoved a rejected lover in the presence of his rival, and at the same time cordial as befitted a Christian who could bear no malice. Captain Parsons, you will not be unaware that I asked Miss Clibborn to be my wife? The fact was fairly generally known in the village, replied James, trying to restrain a smile. Mr. Dryland blushed. I was annoyed at the publicity which the circumstance obtained. The worst of these little places is that people will talk. It was a very noble deed, said James gravely, repeating the common opinion. Not at all, answered the curate, with characteristic modesty, but since it was not to be, since Miss Clibborn's choice has fallen on you, I think it my duty to inform you of my hearty goodwill. I wish, in short, to offer you again my sincerest congratulations. I'm sure that's very kind of you. Two days later, Mrs. Jackson called on a similar errand. She tripped up to James and frankly held out her hand, neatly encased as ever, in a shining black kid glove. Captain Parsons, let us shake hands and let bygones be bygones. You have taken my advice, and if, in the heat of the moment, we both said things which we regret, after all, we're only human. Surely, Mrs. Jackson, I was moderation itself, even when you told me I should infallibly go to hell. You were extremely irritating, said the vicar's lady, smiling, but I forgive you. After all, you paid more attention to what I said than I expected you would. It must be very satisfactory for you to think that... You know I have no ill feeling towards you at all. I gave you a piece of my mind because I thought it was my duty. If you think I stepped over the limits of moderation, I am willing and ready to apologize. What a funny woman you are, said James, looking at her with a good-humoured but rather astonished smile. I'm sure I don't know what makes you think so, she answered, bridling a little. It never occurred to me that you honestly thought you were acting rightly when you came and gave me a piece of your mind, as you call it. I thought your motives were simply malicious and uncharitable. I have a very high ideal of my duties as a clergyman's wife. The human animal is very odd. I don't look upon myself as an animal, Captain Parsons. James smiled. I wonder why we all torture ourselves so unnecessarily. It really seems as if the chief use we made of our reason was to inflict as much pain upon ourselves and upon one another as we possibly could. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, Captain Parsons. When you do anything, are you ever tormented by a doubt whether you are doing right or wrong? Never, she answered firmly. 
there is always a right way and a wrong way, and I'm thankful to say God has given me sufficient intelligence to know which is which, and obviously I choose the right way. What a comfortable idea! I can never help thinking that every right way is partly wrong and every wrong way partly right. There's always so much to be said on both sides. To me it's very hard to know which is which. Only a very weak man could think like that. Possibly. I have long since ceased to flatter myself on my strength of mind. I find it is chiefly a characteristic of unintelligent persons. It was Mary's way to take herself seriously. It flattered her to think that she was not blind to Jamie's faults. She loved him nonetheless on their account, but determined to correct them. He had an unusual way of looking at things and an occasional flippancy in his conversation, both of which she hoped in time to eradicate. With patience, gentleness, and dignity, a woman can do a great deal with a man. One of Mary's friends had a husband with a bad habit of swearing, which was cured in a very simple manner. Whenever he swore, his wife swore too. For instance, he would say, That's a damned bad job. And his wife answered, smiling, Yes, damned bad. He was rather surprised, but quickly ceased to employ objectionable words. Story does not relate whether he also got out of the habit of loving his wife, but that, doubtless, is a minor detail. Mary always looked upon her friend as a pattern. James is not really cynical, she told herself. He says things not because he means them, but because he likes to startle people. It was inconceivable that James should not think on all subjects as she had been brought up to do, and the least originality struck her naturally as a sort of pose. But on account of his illness, Mary allowed him a certain latitude, and when he said anything she did not approve of, instead of arguing the point, merely smiled indulgently and changed the subject. There was plenty of time before her, and when James became her husband, she would have abundant opportunity of raising him to that exalted level upon which she was so comfortably settled. The influence of a simple Christian woman could not fail to have effect. At bottom, James was as good as gold, and she was clever enough to guide him insensibly along the right path. James, perceiving this, scarcely knew whether to be incensed or amused. Sometimes he could see the humour in Mary's ingenuous conceit and in the dogmatic assurance with which she uttered the most astounding opinions. But at others, when she waved aside superciliously a remark that did not square with her prejudices or complacently denied a statement because she had never heard it before, he was irritated beyond all endurance. And it was nothing very outrageous, he said, but merely some commonplace of science which all the world had accepted for twenty years. Mary, however, entrenched herself behind the impenetrable rock of her self-sufficiency. I'm not clever enough to argue with you, she said, but I know I'm right, and I'm quite satisfied. Generally, she merely smiled. What nonsense you talk, Jamie. You don't really believe what you say. But, my dear Mary, it's a solemn fact. There's no possibility of doubting it. It's a truism. Then, with admirable self-command, remembering that James was still an invalid, she would pat his hand and say, Well, it doesn't matter. Of course, you're much cleverer than I am. It must be almost time for your beef tea. James sank back, baffled. Mary's ignorance was an impenetrable cuirass. She would not try to understand. She could not even realize that she might possibly be mistaken. Quite seriously, she thought that what she ignored could be hardly worth knowing. People talk of the advance of education. There may be a little among the lower classes, but it is inconceivable that the English gentry can ever have been more illiterate than they are now. Throughout the country, in the comfortable villa or in the stately mansion, you will find as much prejudice and superstition in the drawing-room as in the kitchen, and you will find the masters less receptive of new ideas than their servants, and into the bargain presumptuously satisfied with their own nescience. James saw that the only way to deal with Mary and with his people was to give in to all their prejudices. He let them talk and held his tongue. 
he shut himself off from them, recognizing that there was, and could be, no bond between them. They were strangers to him. Their ways of looking at every detail of life were different from his. They had not an interest, not a thought, in common. The preparations for the marriage went on. One day, Mary decided that it was her duty to speak with James about his religion. Some of his remarks had made her a little uneasy, and he was quite strong enough now to be seriously dealt with. "'Tell me, Jamie,' she said, in reply to an observation which she was pleased to consider flippant, "'you do believe in God, don't you?' But James had learnt his lesson well. "'My dear, that seems to me a private affair of my own.' "'Are you ashamed to say?' she asked gravely. "'No, but I don't see the advantage of discussing the matter. "'I think you ought to tell me as I'm going to be your wife. "'I shouldn't like you to be an atheist.' "'Atheism is exploded, Mary. "'Only very ignorant persons are certain of what they cannot possibly know.' then I don't see why you should be afraid to tell me. I'm not. Only I think you have no right to ask. We both think that in marriage each should leave the other perfect freedom. I used to imagine the ideal was that married folk should not have a thought nor an idea apart. But that is all rot. The best thing is evidently for each to go his own way and respect the privacy of the other. Complete trust entails complete liberty. I think that is certainly the noblest way of looking at marriage. You may be quite sure I shall not intrude upon your privacy, Mary. I'm sorry I asked you any question. I suppose it's no business of mine. James returned to his book. He had fallen into the habit again of reading incessantly, finding therein his only release from the daily affairs of life. But when Mary left him, he let his novel drop and began to think. He was bitterly amused at what he had said. The parrot words which he had so often heard on Mary's lips sounded strangely on his own. He understood now why the view of matrimony had become prevalent, that it was an institution in which two casual persons lived together for the support of one and the material comfort of the other. Without love, it was the most natural thing that husband and wife should seek all manner of protection from each other. With love, none was needed. It harmonized well with the paradox that a marriage of passion was rather indecent, while lukewarm affection and paltry motives of convenience were elevating and noble. Poor Mary. James knew that she loved him with all her soul, such as it was. A delicate conscience and a collection of principles are not enough to make a great lover, and again he acknowledged to himself that he could give her only friendship. It had been but an ephemeral tenderness which drew him to her for the second time, due to weakness of body and to gratitude. If he ever thought it was love, he knew by now that he had been mistaken. Still, what did it matter? He supposed they would get along very well, as well as most people, better even than if they adored one another. For passion is not conducive to an even life. Fortunately, she was cold and reserved, little given to demonstrative affection. She made few demands upon him, and occupied with her work in the parish and the collection of her trousseau, was content that he should remain with his books. The day fixed upon for the marriage came nearer. But at last, James was seized with a wild revolt. His father was sitting by him. Mary's wedding dress is nearly ready, he said suddenly. So soon? cried James, his heart sinking. She's afraid that something may happen at the last moment, and it won't be finished in time. What could happen? Oh, I mean something at the dressmaker's. Is that all? I imagine there's little danger. There was a pause, broken again by the colonel. I'm so glad you're going to be happily married, Jamie. His son did not answer. But man is never satisfied. I used to think that when I got you spliced, I should have nothing else to wish for.
but now I'm beginning to want little grandsons to rock upon my knees. Jamie's face grew dark. We should never be able to afford children. But they come if one wants them or not, and I shall be able to increase your allowance a little, you know. I don't want you to go short of anything. James said nothing, but he thought, If I had children by her, I should hate them. And then with sudden dismay, losing all the artificial indifference of the last week, he rebelled passionately against his fate. Oh, I hate and loathe her. He felt he could no longer continue the pretense he had been making, for it was all pretense. The effort to be loving and affectionate was torture, so that all his nerves seemed to vibrate with exasperation. Sometimes he had to clench his hands in order to keep himself under restraint. He was acting all the time. James asked himself what madness blinded Mary that she did not see. He remembered how easily speech had come in the old days when they were boy and girl together. They could pass hours side by side without a thought of time, talking of little insignificant things, silent often and always happy. But now he racked his brain for topics of conversation, and the slightest pause seemed irksome and unnatural. He was sometimes bored to death, savagely, cruelly, so that he was obliged to leave Mary for fear that he would say bitter and horrible things. Without his books, he would have gone mad. She must be blind not to see. Then he thought of their married life. How long would it last? The years stretched themselves out endlessly, passing one after another in dreary monotony. Could they possibly be happy? Sooner or later Mary would learn how little he cared for her, and what agony must she suffer then. But it was inevitable. Now, whatever happened, he could not draw back. It was too late for explanations. Would love come? He felt it impossible. He felt, rather, that the physical repulsion which vainly he tried to crush would increase till he abhorred the very sight of his wife. Passionately, he cried out against fate because he had escaped death so often. The gods played with him as a cat plays with a mouse. He had been through dangers innumerable. Twice he had lain on the very threshold of eternal night, and twice he had been snatched back. Far rather would he have died the soldier's death gallantly than live on to this humiliation and despair. A friendly bullet could have saved him many difficulties and much unhappiness. And why had he recovered from the fever? What an irony it was that Mary should claim gratitude for doing him the greatest possible disservice. I can't help it, he cried. I loathe her. The strain upon him was becoming intolerable. James felt that he could not much longer conceal the anguish which was destroying him. But what was to be done? Nothing. 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 James held his head in his hands, cursing his pitiful weakness. Why did he not realize in his convalescence that it was but a passing emotion which endeared Mary to him? He had been so anxious to love her, so eager to give happiness to all concerned, that he had welcomed the least sign of affection. But he knew what love was, and there could be no excuse. He should have had the courage to resist his gratitude. Why should I sacrifice myself, he cried. My life is as valuable as theirs, why should it be always I from whom sacrifice is demanded? But it was no use rebelling. Mary's claims were too strong, and if he lived, he must satisfy them. Yet some respite he could not do without. Away from Primpton, he might regain his calm. James hated London, but even that would be better than the horrible oppression, the constraint he was forced to put upon himself. Ah! He walked up and down the garden for a few minutes to calm down, and went in to his mother. He spoke as naturally as he could. Father tells me that Mary's wedding dress is nearly ready. Yes, it's a little early, but it's well to be on the safe side. It's just occurred to me that I can hardly be married in rags. I think I had better go up to town for a few days to get some things. Must you do that? I think so and there's a lot I want to do.
Oh, well, I dare say Mary won't mind if you don't stay too long, but you must take care not to tire yourself. 20. On his second visit to London, James was more fortunate, for immediately he got inside his club, he found an old friend, a man named Barker, late adjutant of his regiment. Barker had a great deal to tell James of mutual acquaintance, and the pair dined together, going afterwards to a music hall. James felt in better spirits than for some time past, and his good humour carried him well into the following day. In the afternoon, while he was reading a paper, Barker came up to him. "'I say, old chap,' he said, "'I quite forgot to tell you yesterday. You remember Mrs. Wallace, don't you, Pritchard, of that ilk? She's in town and in a passion with you. She says she's written to you twice and you've taken no notice.' "'Really? I thought nobody was in town now.' "'She is. I forget why. She told me a long story, but I didn't listen.' as I knew it would be mostly fibs. She's probably up to some mischief. Let's go round to her place and have tea, shall we? I hardly think I can, replied James, reddening. I've got an engagement at four. Rot! Come on! She's just as stunning as ever. By gad, you should have seen her in her weeds. In her weeds? What the devil do you mean? Didn't you know? P.W. was bowled over at the beginning of the war. After Colenso, I think. By God! I didn't know. I never saw. Oh, well. I didn't know till I came home. Let's stroll along, shall we? She's looking out for number two, but she wants money, so there's no danger for us. James rose mechanically, and putting on his hat, accompanied Barker, all unwitting of the thunder blow that his words had been. Mrs. Wallace was at home. James went upstairs forgetting everything but that the woman he loved was free, free. His heart beat so that he could scarcely breathe. He was afraid of betraying his agitation and had to make a deliberate effort to contain himself. Mrs. Wallace gave a little cry of surprise on seeing James. She had not changed. The black gown she wore, fashionable but slightly fantastic, set off the dazzling olive clearness of her skin and the rich colour of her hair. James turned pale with the passion that consumed him. He could hardly speak. "'You wretch!' she cried, her eyes sparkling. "'I've written to you twice, once to congratulate you and then to ask you to come and see me, and you took not the least notice. "'Barker has just told me you wrote. "'I am so sorry.' Oh, well, I thought you might not receive the letters. I'll forgive you. She wore Indian anklets on her wrists and a barbaric chain about her neck, so that even in the London lodging house she preserved a mysterious oriental charm. In her movements there was a sinuous feline grace which was delightful and yet rather terrifying. One fancied that she was not quite human, but some cruel animal turned into the likeness of a woman. Vague stories floated through the mind of Lamia and the unhappy end of her lovers. The three of them began to talk, chattering of the old days in India, of the war. Mrs. Wallace bemoaned her fate in having to stay in town when all smart people had left. Barker told stories. James did not know how he joined in the flippant conversation. He wondered at his self-command in saying insignificant things, in laughing heartily, when his whole soul was in a turmoil. At length the adjutant went away, and James was left alone with Mrs. Wallace. "'Do you wish me to go?' he asked. "'You can turn me out if you do.' "'Oh, I should, without hesitation,' she retorted, laughing. "'But I'm bored to death, and I want you to amuse me.' Strangely enough, James felt that the long absence had created no barrier between them. Thinking of Mrs. Wallace incessantly, sometimes against his will, sometimes with a fierce delight, holding with her imaginary conversations, he felt, on the contrary, that he knew her far more intimately than he had ever done. There seemed to be a link between them, as though something had passed which prevented them from ever again becoming strangers. James felt he had her confidence, and he was able to talk frankly as before, 
in his timidity, he had never ventured. He treated her with the loving friendliness with which he had been used to treat the imaginary creature of his dreams. You haven't changed a bit, he said, looking at her. Did you expect me to be haggard and wrinkled? I never let myself grow old. One only needs strength of mind to keep young indefinitely. I'm surprised, because you're so exactly as I've thought of you. Have you thought of me often? The fire flashed to Jamie's eyes, and it was on his lips to break out passionately, telling her how he had lived constantly with her recollection, how she had been meat and drink to him, life and breath and soul. But he restrained himself. Sometimes, he answered, smiling. Mrs. Wallace smiled, too. I seem to remember that you vowed once to think of me always. One vows all sorts of things. He hoped she could not hear the trembling in his voice. You're very cool, friend Jim, and much less shy than you used to be. You were a perfect monster of bashfulness, and your conscience was a most alarming animal. It used to frighten me out of my wits. I hope you keep it now under lock and key, like the beasts in the zoo. James was telling himself that it was folly to remain, that he must go at once and never return. The recollection of Mary came back to him, in the straw hat and the soiled serge dress, sitting in the dining room with his father and mother. She had brought her knitting so as not to waste a minute, and while they talked of him, her needles clicked rapidly to and fro. Mrs. Wallace was lying in a long chair, coiled up in a serpentine characteristic attitude. Every movement wafted to him the oppressive perfume she wore. The smile on her lips, the caress of her eyes, were maddening. He loved her more even than he had imagined. His love was a fury, blind and destroying. He repeated to himself that he must fly, but the heaviness in his limbs chained him to her side. He had no will, no strength. He was a reed, bending to every word she spoke and to every look. Her fascination was not human, the calm, voluptuous look of her eyes was too cruel, and she was poised like a serpent about to spring. At last, however, James was obliged to take his leave. I've stayed an unconscionable time. Have you? I've not noticed it. Did she care for him? He took her hand to say goodbye, and the pressure sent the blood racing through his veins. He remembered vividly the passionate embrace of their last farewell. He thought then that he should never see her again, and it was fate which had carried him to her feet. Oh, how he longed now to take her in his arms and to cover her soft mouth with his kisses. What are you doing this evening? she said. Nothing. Would you like to take me to the Carlton? You remember you promised. Oh, that is good of you. Of course I should like it. At last he couldn't hide the fire in his heart, and the simple words were said so vehemently that Mrs. Wallace looked up in surprise. She withdrew the hand which he was still holding. Very well, you may fetch me at a quarter to eight. After taking Mrs. Wallace home, James paced the streets for an hour in a turmoil of wild excitement. They had dined at the Carlton expensively, as was her wish, and then, driving to the Empire, James had taken a box. Through the evening, he had scarcely known how to maintain his calm, how to prevent himself from telling her all that was in his heart. After the misery he had gone through, he snatched at happiness with eager grasp, determined to enjoy to the full every single moment of it. He threw all scruples to the wind. He was sick and tired of holding himself in. He had checked himself too long, and now, at all hazards, must let himself go. Bridle and curb now were of no avail. He neither could nor would suppress his passion, though it devoured him like a raging fire. He thought his conscientiousness absurd. Why could he not, like other men, take the brief joy of life? Why could he not gather the roses without caring whether they would quickly fade? Let me eat, drink, and be merry, he cried.
for tomorrow I die. It was Wednesday, and on the Saturday he had promised to return to Little Primpton, but he put aside all thought of that, except as an incentive to make the most of his time. He had wrestled with temptation and been overcome, and he gloried in his defeat. He would make no further effort to stifle his love. His strength had finally deserted him, and he had no will to protect himself. He would give himself over entirely to his passion, and the future might bring what it would. "'I'm a fool to torment myself,' he cried. "'After all, what does anything matter but love?' Mrs. Wallace was engaged for the afternoon of the next day, but she had invited him to dine with her. They feed you abominably at my place, she said, but I'll do my best, and we shall be able to talk. Until then, he would not live, and all sorts of wild, mad thoughts ran through his head. Is there a greater fool on earth than the virtuous prig? he muttered, savagely. He could not sleep, but tossed from side to side thinking ever of the soft hands and the red lips that he so ardently wished to kiss. In the morning he sent to Half Moon Street a huge basket of flowers. It was good of you, said Mrs. Wallace when he arrived, pointing to the roses scattered through the room. She wore three in her hair, trailing behind one ear in an exotic, charming fashion. It's only you who could think of wearing them like that, do they make me look very barbaric? She was flattered by the admiration in his eyes. You certainly have improved since I saw you last. Now, shall we stay here or go somewhere? She asked after dinner when they were smoking cigarettes. Let us stay here. Mrs. Wallace began talking the old nonsense which in days past had delighted James. It enchanted him to hear her say in the tone of voice he knew so well, just those things which he had a thousand times repeated to himself. He looked at her with a happy smile, his eyes fixed upon her, taking in every movement. "'I don't believe you're listening to a word I'm saying,' she cried at last. "'Why don't you answer?' "'Go on. I like to see you talk. It's long since I've had the chance. You spoke yesterday as though you hadn't missed me much.' I didn't mean it. You knew I didn't mean it. She smiled mockingly. I thought it doubtful. If it had been true, you could hardly have said anything so impolite. I've thought of you always. That's why I feel I know you so much better now. I don't change. What I felt once, I feel always. I wonder what you mean by that. I mean that I love you as passionately as when last I saw you. Oh. I love you ten times more. And the girl with the bun and the strenuous look? You were engaged when I knew you last? James was silent for a moment. I'm going to be married to her on the 10th of October, he said finally, in an expressionless voice. You don't say that as if you were wildly enthusiastic. Why did you remind me? cried James. I was so happy. Oh, I hate her. Then why on earth are you marrying her? I can't help it, I must. You've brought it all back. How could you be so cruel? When I came back from the Cape, I broke the engagement off. I made her utterly miserable, and I took all the pleasure out of my poor father's life. I knew I'd done right. I knew that unless I loved her it was madness to marry. I felt even that it was unclean. Oh, you don't know how I've argued it all out with myself time after time. I was anxious to do right, and I felt such a cad. I can't escape from my bringing up. You can't imagine what are the chains that bind us in England. We're wrapped from our infancy in the swaddling clothes of prejudice, ignorance, and false ideas. And when we grow up, though we know they're all absurd and horrible, we can't escape from them. They've become part of our very flesh. Then I grew ill. I nearly died, and Mary nursed me devotedly. I don't know what came over me. I felt so ill and weak. I was grateful to her. The old self seized me again, and I was ashamed of what I'd done. I wanted to make them all happy. I asked her again to marry me, and she said she would. 
I thought I could love her, but I can't. I can't. God help me. Jamie's passion was growing uncontrollable. He walked up and down the room and then threw himself heavily on a chair. Oh, I know it was weakness. I used to pride myself on my strength of mind, but I'm weak. I'm weaker than a woman. I'm a poor reed, vacillating, uncertain, purposeless. I don't know my own mind. I haven't the courage to act according to my convictions. I'm afraid to give pain. They all think I'm brave, but I'm simply a pitiful coward. I feel that Mary has entrapped me and I hate her. I know she has good qualities, heaps of them, but I can't see them. I only know that the mere touch of her hand curdles my blood. She excites absolute physical repulsion in me. I can't help it. I know it's madness to marry her, but I can't do anything else. I daren't inflict a second time the humiliation and misery upon her or the unhappiness upon my people. Mrs. Wallace now was serious. And do you really care for anyone else? He turned savagely upon her. You know I do. You know I love you with all my heart and soul. You know I've loved you passionately from the first day I saw you. Didn't you feel, even when we were separated, that my love was inextinguishable? Didn't you feel it always with you? Oh, my dear, my dear, you must have known that death was too weak to touch my love. I tried to crush it because neither you nor I was free. Your husband was my friend. I couldn't do anything, Blackguardly. I ran away from you. What a fool you must have thought me. And now I know that at last we were both free, I might have made you love me. I had my chance of happiness at last. What I'd longed for, cursing myself for treachery, had come to pass. But I never knew. In my weakness, I surrendered my freedom. Oh, God, what shall I do? He hid his face in his hands and groaned with agony. Mrs. Wallace was silent for a while. I don't know if it will be any consolation for you, she said at last. You're sure to know sooner or later, and I may as well tell you now. I'm engaged to be married. What? cried James, springing up. It's not true, it's not true. Why not? Of course it's true. You can't. Oh, my dearest, be kind to me. Don't be silly, there's a good boy. You're going to be married yourself in a month, and you really can't expect me to remain single because you fancy you care for me. I shouldn't have told you, only I thought it would make things easier for you. You never cared two straws for me. I knew that. You needn't throw it in my face. After all, I was a married woman. I wonder how much you minded when you heard your husband was lying dead on the veld. My dear boy, he wasn't. He died of fever at Durban, quite comfortably in a bed. Were you sorry? Of course I was. He was extremely satisfactory and not at all exacting. James did not know why he asked the questions. They came to his lips unbidden. He was sick at heart, angry, contemptuous. I'm going to marry a Mr. Bryant, but of course, not immediately, she went on, occupied with her own thoughts and pleased to talk of them. What is he? Nothing. He's a landed proprietor. She said this with a certain pride. James looked at her scornfully. His love all through had been mingled with contrary elements, and trying to subdue it, he had often insisted upon the woman's vulgarity and lack of taste and snobbishness. He thought bitterly now that the daughter of the Portuguese and of the riding master had done very well for herself. Really, I think you're awfully unreasonable, she said. You might make yourself pleasant. I can't, he said gravely. Let me go away. You don't know what I've felt for you. In my madness, I fancied that you must realize my love. I thought even that you might care for me a little in return. You're quite the nicest boy I've ever known. I like you immensely. But you like the landed proprietor better. You're very wise. He can marry you. Goodbye. I don't want you to think I'm horrid, she said, going up to him and taking his arm. It was an instinct with her to caress people and make them fond of her. After all, it's not my fault. Have I blamed you? I'm sorry. I had no right to.
What are you going to do? I don't know. I can always shoot myself if things get unendurable. Thank God there's always that refuge. Oh, I hope you won't do anything silly. It would be unlike me, James murmured grimly. I'm so dreadfully prosaic and matter-of-fact. Goodbye. Mrs. Wallace was really sorry for James, and she took his hand affectionately. She always thought it cost so little to be amiable. We may never meet again, she said, but we shall still be friends, Jim. Are you going to say that you'll be a sister to me, as Mary told the curate? Won't you kiss me before you go? James shook his head, not trusting himself to answer. The light in his life had all gone. The ray of sunshine was hidden. The heavy clouds had closed in, and all the rest was darkness. But he tried to smile at Mrs. Wallace as he touched her hand. He hardly dared look at her again, knowing from old experience how every incident and every detail of her person would rise tormentingly before his recollection. But at last he pulled himself together. I'm sorry I've made a fool of myself, he said quietly. I hope you'll be very happy. Please forget all I've said to you. It was only nonsense. Goodbye. I'll send you a bit of my wedding cake. 21. James was again in Little Primpton, ill at ease and unhappy. The scene with Mrs. Wallace had broken his spirit, and he was listless now, indifferent to what happened. The world had lost its color and the sun its light. In his quieter moments, he had known that it was impossible for her to care anything about him. He understood her character fairly well and realized that he had been only a toy, a pastime to a woman who needed admiration as the breath of her nostrils. But notwithstanding, some inner voice had whispered constantly that his love could not be altogether in vain. It seemed strong enough to travel the infinite distance to her heart and awaken at least a kindly feeling. He was humble and wanted very little. Sometimes he had even felt sure that he was loved. The truth rent his heart and filled it with bitterness. The woman who was his whole being had forgotten him, and the woman who loved him he hated. He tried to read, striving to forget, but his trouble overpowered him, and he could think of nothing but the future, dreadful and inevitable. The days passed slowly, monotonously, and as each night came, he shuddered at the thought that time was flying. He was drifting on without hope, tortured and uncertain. Oh, I'm so weak, he cried. I'm so weak. He knew very well what he should do if he was strong of will. A firm man in his place would cut the knot brutally. A letter to Mary, a letter to his people, and flight. After all, why should he sacrifice his life for the sake of others? The catastrophe was only partly his fault. It was unreasonable that he alone should suffer. If his colonel came to hear of the circumstance and disapproving questioned him, he could send in his papers. James was bored intensely by the dull routine of regimental life in time of peace. It was a question of performing day after day the same rather unnecessary duties, seeing the same people, listening to the same chatter, the same jokes, the same chaff. And added to the incurable dullness of the mess was the irksome feeling of being merely an overgrown schoolboy at the beck and call of every incompetent and foolish senior. Life was too short to waste in such solemn trifling, masquerading in a ridiculous costume which had to be left at home when any work was to be done. But he was young, with the world before him. There were many careers free to the man who had no fear of death. Africa opened her dusky arms to the adventurer, ruthless and desperate. The world was so large and manifold, there was ample scope for all his longing. If there were difficulties, he could overcome them. Perils would add salt to the attempt. Freedom would be like strong wine. Ah, that was what he desired, freedom, freedom to feel, that he was his own master, that he was not enchained by the love and hate of others, by the ties of convention and of habit. Every bond was tedious. He had nothing to lose and everything to win. But just those ties, 
which every man may divide of his own free will, are the most oppressive. They are unfelt, unseen, till suddenly they burn the wrists like fetters of fire, and the poor wretch who wears them has no power to help himself. James knew he had not strength for this fearless disregard of others. He dared not face the pain he would cause. He was acting like a fool. His kindness was only cowardly. But to be cruel required more courage than he possessed. If he went away, his anguish would never cease. His vivid imagination would keep before his mind's eye the humiliation of Mary, the unhappiness of his people. He pictured the consternation and the horror when they discovered what he had done. At first they would refuse to believe that he was capable of acting in so blackguardly a way. They would think it a joke, or that he was mad. And then the shame, when they realized the truth. How could he make such a return for all the affection and the gentleness he had received? His father, whom he loved devotedly, would be utterly crushed. It would kill him, muttered James. And then he thought of his poor mother, affectionate and kind, but capable of hating him if he acted contrary to her code of honour. Her immaculate virtue made her very hard. She exacted the highest from herself and demanded no less from others. James remembered in his boyhood how she punished his petty crimes by refusing to speak to him, going about in cold and angry silence. He had never forgotten the icy indignation of her face when once she had caught him lying. Oh, these good people, how pitiless they can be! He would never have courage to confront the unknown dangers of a new life, unloved, unknown, unfriended. He was too merciful. His heart bled at the pain of others. He was constantly afraid of soiling his hands. It required a more unscrupulous man than he to cut all ties and push out into the world with no weapons but intelligence and a ruthless heart. Above all, he dreaded his remorse. He knew that he would brood over what he had done till it attained the proportions of a monomania. His conscience would never give him peace. So long as he lived, the claims of Mary would call to him, and in the furthermost parts of the earth he would see her silent agony. James knew himself too well. And the only solution was that which, in a moment of passionate bitterness, had come thoughtlessly to his lips. I can always shoot myself. I hope you won't do anything silly, Mrs. Wallace had answered. It would be silly. After all, one has only one life. But sometimes one has to do silly things. The whim seized James to visit the Larchers, and one day he set out for Ashford, near which they lived. He was very modest about his attempt to save their boy, and told himself that such courage as it required was purely instinctive. He had gone back without realizing in the least that there was any danger. Seeing young Larcher wounded and helpless, it had seemed the obvious thing to get him to a place of safety. In the heat of action, fellows were constantly doing reckless things. Everyone had a sort of idea that he at least would not be hit, and James, by no means oppressed with his own heroism, knew that courageous deeds without number were performed and passed unseen. It was a mere chance that the incident in which he took part was noticed. Again, he had from the beginning an absolute conviction that his interference was nothing less than disastrous. Probably the Boer sharpshooters would have let alone the wounded man, and afterwards their doctors would have picked him up and properly attended to him. James could not forget that it was in his very arms that Larcher had been killed, and he repeated, If I had minded my own business, he might have been alive to this day. It occurred to him also that with his experience he was much more useful than the callow, ignorant boy, so that to risk his more valuable life to save the others from the point of view of the general good was foolish rather than praiseworthy. But it appealed to his sense of irony to receive the honour which he was so little conscious of deserving. The Larchers had been anxious to meet James, and he was curious to know what they were like. 
There was at the back of his mind also a desire to see how they conducted themselves, whether they were still prostrate with grief or reconciled to the inevitable. Reggie had been an only son, just as he was. James sent no message but arrived unexpectedly and found that they lived some way from the station in a new red-brick villa. As he walked to the front door, he saw people playing tennis at the side of the house. He asked if Mrs. Larcher was at home, and being shown into the drawing room, the lady came to him from the tennis lawn. He explained who he was. Of course I know quite well, she said. I saw your portrait in the illustrated papers. She shook hands cordially, but James fancied she tried to conceal a slight look of annoyance. He saw his visit was inopportune. We're having a little tennis party, she said. It seems a pity to waste the fine weather, doesn't it? A shout of laughter came from the lawn, and a number of voices were heard talking loudly. Mrs. Larcher glanced towards them uneasily. She felt that James would expect them to be deeply mourning for the dead son, and it was a little incongruous that on his first visit he should find the whole family so boisterously gay. "'Shall we go out to them?' said Mrs. Larcher. "'We're just going to have tea, and I'm sure you must be dying for some. If you'd let us know you were coming, we should have sent to meet you.' James had divined that if he came at a fixed hour, they would all have tuned their minds to a certain key, and he would see nothing of their natural state. They went to the lawn, and James was introduced to a pair of buxom, healthy-looking girls, panting a little after their violent exercise. They were dressed in white, in a rather masculine fashion, and the only sign of mourning was the black tie that each wore in a sailor's knot. They shook hands vigorously, it was a family trait, and then seemed at a loss for conversation. James, as was his way, did not help them, and they plunged at last into a discussion about the weather and the dustiness of the road from Ashford to their house. Presently, a loose-limbed young man strolled up and was presented to James. He appeared on friendly terms with the two girls, who called him Bobbikins. How long have you been back? he asked. I was out in the Imperial Yeomanry, only I got fever and had to come home. James stiffened himself a little, with the instinctive dislike of the regular for the volunteer. Oh, yes. Did you go as a trooper? Yes, and pretty rough it was, I can tell you. He began to talk of his experience in a resonant voice, apparently well pleased with himself, while the red-faced girls looked at him admiringly. James wondered whether the youth intended to marry them both. The conversation was broken by the appearance of Mr. Larcher, a rosy-cheeked and bee-whiskered man, dapper and suave. He had been picking flowers and handed a bouquet to one of his guests. James fancied he was a prosperous merchant who had retired and set up as a country gentleman. But if he was the least polished of the family, he was also the most simple. He greeted the visitor very heartily and offered to take him over his new conservatory. "'My husband takes everyone to the new conservatory,' said Mrs. Larcher, laughing apologetically. "'It's the biggest round Ashford,' explained the worthy man. James, thinking he wished to talk of his son, consented, and as they walked away, Mr. Larcher pointed out his fruit trees, his pigeons. He was a fancier, said he, and attended to the birds entirely himself, then in the conservatory made James admire his orchids and the luxuriance of his maiden hair. "'I suppose these sort of things grow in the open air at the Cape?' he asked. "'I believe everything grows there.' Of his son he said absolutely nothing, and presently they rejoined the others. The Larchers were evidently estimable persons, healthy-minded and normal, but a little common. James asked himself why they had invited him if they wished to hear nothing of their boy's tragic death. Could they be so anxious to forget him that every reference was distasteful? He wondered how Reggie had managed to grow up so simple, frank, and charming amid these surroundings. There was a certain pretentiousness about his people 
which caused them to escape complete vulgarity only by a hair's breadth. But they appeared anxious to make much of James, and in his absence had explained who he was to the remaining visitors, and these beheld him now with an awe which the hero found rather comic. Mrs. Larcher invited him to play tennis, and when he declined, seemed hardly to know what to do with him. Once, when her younger daughter laughed more loudly than usual at the very pointed chaff of the imperial yeoman, she slightly frowned at her, with a scarcely perceptible but significant glance in Jamie's direction. To her relief, however, the conversation became general, and James found himself talking with Miss Larcher of the cricket week at Canterbury. After all, he could not be surprised at the family's general happiness. Six months had passed since Reggie's death, and they could not remain in perpetual mourning. It was very natural that the living should forget the dead, otherwise life would be too horrible, and it was possibly only the larcher's nature to laugh and to talk more loudly than most people. James saw that it was a united, affectionate household, homely and kind, cursed with no particular depth of feeling, and if they had not resigned themselves to the boy's death, they were doing their best to forget that he had ever lived. It was obviously the best thing, and it would be cruel, too cruel, to expect people never to regain their cheerfulness. I think I must be off, said James after a while. The trains run so awkwardly to Tunbridge Wells. They made polite efforts to detain him, but James fancied they were not sorry for him to go. You must come and see us another day when we're alone, said Mrs. Larcher. We want to have a long talk with you. It's very kind of you to ask me, he replied, not committing himself. And then Mrs. Larcher accompanied him back to the drawing room, followed by her husband. I thought you might like a photograph of Reggie, she said. This was her first mention of the dead son, and her voice neither shook nor had in it any unwonted expression. I should like it very much. It was on Jamie's tongue to say how fond he had been of the boy, and how he regretted his sad end. But he restrained himself, thinking if the wounds of grief were closed, it was cruel and unnecessary to reopen them. Mrs. Larcher found the photograph and gave it to James. Her husband stood by, saying nothing. I think that's the best we have of him. She shook hands, and then evidently nerved herself to say something further. We're very grateful to you, Captain Parsons, for what you did, and we're glad they gave you the Victoria Cross. I suppose you didn't bring it today, inquired Mr. Larcher. I'm afraid not. They showed him out of the front door. Mind you come and see us again, but let us know beforehand if you possibly can. Shortly afterwards, James received from the Larchers a golden cigarette case with a Victoria cross in diamonds on one side and an inscription on the other. It was much too magnificent for use, evidently expensive and not in very good taste. I wonder whether they take that as equal in value to their son, said James. Mary was rather dazzled. Isn't it beautiful? she cried. Of course it's too valuable to use, but it'll do to put in our drawing room. Don't you think it should be kept under a glass case? asked James, with his grave smile. It'll get so dirty if we leave it out, won't it? replied Mary, seriously. I wish there were no inscription. It won't fetch so much if we get hard up and have to pop our jewels. Oh, James, cried Mary, shocked. You surely wouldn't do a thing like that. James was pleased to have seen the larches. It satisfied and relieved him to know that human sorrow was not beyond human endurance. As the greatest of their gifts, the gods have vouchsafed to man a happy forgetfulness. In six months the boy's family were able to give parties, to laugh and jest as if they had suffered no loss at all, and the thought of this cleared his way a little. If the worst came to the worst, and that desperate step of which he had spoken seemed his only refuge, he could take it with less apprehension. Pain to those he loved was inevitable, but it would not last very long, and his death would trouble them far less than his dishonour.
Time was pressing, and James still hesitated, hoping distractedly for some unforeseen occurrence that would at least delay the marriage. The house of death was dark and terrible, and he could not walk rashly to its dreadful gates. Something would surely happen. He wanted time to think, time to see whether there was really no escape. How horrible it was that one could know nothing for certain. He was torn and rent by his indecision. Major Forsyth had been put off by several duchesses and was driven to spend a few economical weeks at Little Primpton. He announced that since Jamie's wedding was so near, he would stay till it was over. Finding also that his nephew had not thought of a best man, he offered himself. He had acted as such many times at the most genteel functions, and with a pleasant confusion of metaphor, assured James that he knew the ropes right down to the ground. Three weeks today, my boy, he said heartily to James one morning on coming down to breakfast. Is it? replied James. Getting excited? Wildly. Upon my word, Jamie, you're the coolest lover I've ever seen. Why, I've hardly known how to keep in some of the fellows I've been best man to. I'm feeling a bit seedy today, Uncle William. James thanked his stars that ill health was deemed sufficient excuse for all his moodiness. Mary spared him the rounds among her sick and needy, whom, notwithstanding the approaching event, she would on no account neglect. She told Uncle William he was not to worry her lover, but leave him quietly with his books, and no one interfered when he took long, solitary walks in the country. Jamie's reading now was a pretense. His brain was too confused, he was too harassed and uncertain to understand a word and he spent his time face to face with the eternal problem, trying to see a way out, when before him was an impassable wall, still hoping blindly that something would happen, some catastrophe which should finish at once all his perplexities and everything else besides. 22. In solitary walks James had found his only consolation. He knew, even in that populous district unfrequented parts, where he could wander without fear of interruption. Among the trees and the flowers in the broad meadows, he forgot himself. And his senses sharpened by long absence, he learnt for the first time the exquisite charm of English country. He loved the spring, with its yellow, countless buttercups spread over the green fields like a cloth of gold, whereon might fitly walk the angels of Mesa Perugino. The colours were so delicate that one could not believe it possible for paints and paintbrush to reproduce them. The atmosphere visibly surrounded things, softening their outlines. Sometimes from a hill higher than the rest, James looked down at the plain, bathed in golden sunlight. The fields of corn, the fields of clover, the roads and the rivulets formed themselves in that flood of light into an harmonious pattern, luminous and ethereal. A pleasant reverie filled his mind, unanalysable, a waking dream of half-voluptuous sensation. On the other side of the common, James knew a wood of tall fir trees, dark and ragged, their sombre green veiled in a silvery mist, as though, like a chill vapour, the hoarfrost of a hundred winters still lingered among their branches. At the edge of the hill, up which they climbed in serried hundreds, stood here and there an oak tree just bursting into leaf, clothed with its newborn verdure, like the bride of the young god, Spring. And the everlasting youth of the oak trees contrasted wonderfully with the undying age of the firs. Then later, in the height of the summer, James found the pine wood cool and silent, fitting his humour. It was like the forest of life, the grey and sombre labyrinth where wandered the poet of hell and death. The tall trees rose straight and slender, like the barren masts of sailing ships, the gentle aromatic odour, the light subdued, the purple mist so faint as to be scarcely discernible, a mere tinge of warmth in the day, all gave him an exquisite sense of rest. Here he could forget his trouble and give himself over to the love which seemed his real life. 
Here the recollection of Mrs. Wallace gained flesh and blood, seeming so real that he almost stretched out his arms to seize her. His footfall on the brown needles was noiseless, and the tread was soft and easy. The odours filled him like an eastern drug, with drowsy intoxication. But all that now was gone. When, unbidden, the well-known laugh rang again in his ears, or he felt on his hands the touch of the slender fingers, James turned away with a gesture of distaste. Now Mrs. Wallace brought him only bitterness, and he tortured himself insanely trying to forget her. With tenfold force the sensation returned, which had so terribly oppressed him before his illness. He felt that nature had become intolerably monotonous. The circumscribed prim country was horrible. On every inch of it the hand of man was apparent. It was a prison, and his hands and feet were chained with heavy iron. The dark, immovable clouds were piled upon one another in giant masses, so distinct and sharply cut, so rounded, that one almost saw the impression of the fingers of some titanic sculptor, and they hung low down, overwhelming, so that James could scarcely breathe. The sombre elms were too well ordered, the meadows too carefully tended. All round the hills were dark and drear, and that very fertility, that fat, Kentish luxuriance, added to the oppression. It was a task impossible to escape from that iron circle. All power of flight abandoned him. Oh, he loathed it. The past centuries of people, living in a certain way, with certain standards influenced by certain emotions, were too strong for him. James was like a foolish bird, a bird born in a cage, without power to attain its freedom. His lust for a free life was futile. He acknowledged with cruel self-contempt that he was weaker than a woman, ineffectual. He could not lead the life of his little circle, purposeless and untrue. And yet he had not power to lead a life of his own. Uncertain, vacillating, torn between the old and the new, his reason led him, his conscience drew him back. But the ties of his birth and ancestry were too strong. He had not the energy even of the poor tramp, who carries with him his whole fortune and leaves in the lap of the gods the uncertain future. James envied with all his heart the beggar boy, wandering homeless and penniless, but free. He, at least, had not these inhuman fetters which it was death to suffer and death to cast off. He, indeed, could make the world his servant. Freedom, freedom. If one were only unconscious of captivity, what would it matter? It is the knowledge that kills. And James walked again by the neat iron railing which enclosed the fields, his head aching with the rigidity and decorum, wishing vainly for just one piece of barren, unkept land to remind him that all the world was not a prison. Already the autumn had come. The rich, mouldering colours were like an air melancholy with the approach of inevitable death. But in those passionate tints, in the red and gold of the apples, in the many tones of the first fallen leaves, there was still something which forbade one to forget that in the death and decay of nature there was always the beginning of other life. Yet to James the autumn heralded death with no consoling afterthought. He had nothing to live for since he knew that Mrs. Wallace could never love him. His love for her had borne him up and sustained him, but now it was hateful and despicable. After all, his life was his own, to do what he liked with. The love of others had no right to claim his self-respect. If he had duties to them, he had duties to himself also, and more vehemently than ever, James felt that such a union as was before him could only be a degradation. He repeated with new emotion that marriage without love was prostitution. If death was the only way in which he could keep clean that body ignorantly despised, why, he was not afraid of death. He had seen it too often for the thought to excite alarm. It was but a common mechanical process, quickly finished and not more painful than could be borne. 
The flesh is all which is certainly immortal. The dissolution of consciousness is the signal of new birth. Out of corruption springs fresh life, like the roses from a Roman tomb, and the body, one with the earth, pursues the eternal round. But one day James told himself impatiently that all these thoughts were mad and foolish. He could only have them because he was still out of health. Life, after all, was the most precious thing in the world. It was absurd to throw it away like a broken toy. He rebelled against the fate which seemed forcing itself upon him. He determined to make the effort and, come what might, break the hateful bonds. It only required a little courage, a little strength of mind. If others suffered, he had suffered too. The sacrifice they demanded was too great. But when he returned to Primpton House, the inevitability of it all forced itself once again upon him. He shrugged his shoulders despairingly. It was no good. The whole atmosphere oppressed him so that he felt powerless. Some hidden influence surrounded James, sucking from his blood, as it were, all manliness, dulling his brain. He became a mere puppet, acting in accordance to principles that were not his own, automatic, willless. His father sat, as ever, in the dining room by the fire, for only in the warmest weather could he do without artificial heat, and he read the paper, sometimes aloud, making little comments. His mother, at the table, on a stiff-backed chair, was knitting, everlastingly knitting. Outwardly, there was in them a placid content and a gentleness which made them seem pliant as wax, but really they were iron. James knew at last how pitiless was their love, how inhumanly cruel their intolerance, and of the two his father seemed more implacable, more horribly relentless. His mother's anger was bearable, but the colonel's very weakness was a deadly weapon. His despair, his dumb sorrow, his entire dependence on the forbearance of others were more tyrannical than the most despotic power. James was indeed a bird beating himself against the imprisoning cage, and its bars were loving kindness and trust, tears, silent distress, bitter disillusion, and old age. Where's Mary? asked James. She's in the garden, walking with Uncle William. How well they get on together, said the Colonel, smiling. James looked at his father and thought he had never seen him so old and feeble. His hands were almost transparent. His thin white hair, his bowed shoulders, gave an impression of utter weakness. Are you very glad the wedding is so near, father? asked James, placing his hand gently on the old man's shoulder. I should think I was. You want to get rid of me so badly? A man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We shall have to do without you. I wonder whether you are fonder of Mary than of me. The colonel did not answer, but Mrs. Parsons laughed. My impression is that your father has grown so devoted to Mary that he hardly thinks you worthy of her. Really? And yet you want me to marry her, don't you, Daddy? It's the wish of my heart. Were you very wretched when our engagement was broken off? Don't talk of it. Now it's all settled, Jamie. I can tell you that I'd sooner see you dead at my feet than that you should break your word to Mary. James laughed. And you, mother? he asked lightly. She did not answer, but looked at him earnestly. What, you too? Would you rather see me dead than not married to Mary? What a bloodthirsty pair you are! James, laughing, spoke so gaily it never dawned on them that his words meant more than was obvious, and yet he felt that they, loving but implacable, had signed his death warrant. With smiling faces they had thrown open the portals of that house, and he, smiling, was ready to enter. Mary at that moment came in, followed by Uncle William. Well, Jamie, there you are, 
she cried, in that hard, metallic voice, which to James betrayed so obviously the meanness of her spirit and her self-complacency. Where on earth have you been? She stood by the table, straight, uncompromising, self-reliant, by her immaculate virtue, by the strength of her narrow will, she completely domineered the others. She felt herself capable of managing them all and, in fact, had been giving Uncle William a friendly little lecture upon some action of which she disapproved. Mary had left off her summer things and wore again the plain serge skirt, and because it was rainy, the battered straw hat of the preceding winter. She was using up her old things, and having got all possible wear out of them, intended on the day before her marriage generously to distribute them among the poor. "'Is my face very red?' she asked. "'There's a lot of wind today.' To James she had never seemed more unfeminine. That physical repulsion which at first had terrified him now was grown into an ungovernable hate. Everything Mary did irritated and exasperated him. He wondered she did not see the hatred in his eyes as he looked at her, answering her question. Oh no, he said to himself, I would rather shoot myself than marry you. His dislike was unreasonable, but he could not help it, and the devotion of his parents made him detest her all the more. He could not imagine what they saw in her. With hostile glance, he watched her movements as she took off her hat and arranged her hair, grimly drawn back and excessively neat. She fetched her knitting from Mrs. Parsons's workbasket and sat down. All her actions had in them an insufferable air of patronage, and she seemed more than usually pleased with herself. James had an insane desire to hurt her, to ruffle that self-satisfaction, and he wanted to say something that should wound her to the quick and all the time he laughed and jested as though he were in the highest spirits. "'And what were you doing this morning, Mary?' asked Colonel Parsons. "'Oh, I biked into Tunbridge Wells with Mr. Dryland to play golf. He plays a rattling good game.' "'Did he beat you?' "'Well, no,' she answered modestly. "'It so happened that I beat him, but he took his thrashing remarkably well.' Some men get so angry when they're beaten by a girl. The curate has many virtues, said James. He was talking about you, Jamie. He said he thought you disliked him, but I told him I was certain you didn't. He's really such a good man, one can't help liking him. He said he'd like to teach you golf. And is he going to? Certainly not. I mean to do that myself. There are many things you want to teach me, Mary. You'll have your hands full. Oh, by the way, Father told me to remind you and Uncle William that you were shooting with him the day after tomorrow. You're to fetch him at ten. I hadn't forgotten, replied James. Uncle William, we shall have to clean our guns tomorrow. James had come to a decision at last, and meant to waste no time. Indeed, there was none to waste. And to remind him how near was the date fixed for the wedding, were the preparations almost complete. One or two presents had already arrived. With all his heart, he thanked his father and mother for having made the way easier for him. He thought what he was about to do the kindest thing both to them and to Mary. Under no circumstances could he marry her. That would be adding a greater lie to those which he had already been forced into, and the misery was more than he could bear but his death was the only other way of satisfying her undoubted claims. He had little doubt that in six months he would be as well forgotten as poor Reggie Larcher, and he did not care. He was sick of the whole business and wanted the quiet of death. His love for Mrs. Wallace would never give him peace upon earth. It was utterly futile and yet unconquerable. James saw his opportunity in Colonel Clibborn's invitation to shoot. He was most anxious to make the affair seem accidental, and that, in cleaning his gun, was easy. He had been wounded before, and knew that the pain was not very great. He had, therefore, nothing to fear. Now at last he regained his spirits. He did not read or walk, but spent the day talking with his father. 
he wished the last impression he would leave to be as charming as possible and took great pains to appear at his best. He slept well that night and in the morning dressed himself with unusual care. At Primpton House they breakfasted at eight and afterwards James smoked his pipe, reading the newspaper. He was a little astonished at his calm, for doubt no longer assailed him, and the indecision which paralysed all his faculties had disappeared. It is the beginning of my freedom, he thought. All human interests had abandoned him, except a vague sensation of amusement. He saw the humour of the comedy he was acting and dispassionately approved himself because he did not give way to histrionics. Well, Uncle William, he said at last, what do you say to setting to work on our guns? I'm always ready for everything, said Major Forsyth. Come on, then. They went into what they called the harness room, and James began carefully to clean his gun. I think I'll take my coat off, he said. I can work better without. The gun had not been used for several months, and James had a good deal to do. He leant over and rubbed a little rust off the lock. Upon my word, said Uncle William, I've never seen anyone handle a gun so carelessly as you. Do you call yourself a soldier? I'm a bit slack, replied James, laughing. People are always telling me that. Well, take care, for goodness sake. It may be loaded. Oh, no, there's no danger. It's not loaded, and besides, it's locked. Still, you oughtn't to hold it like that. It would be rather comic if I killed myself accidentally. I wonder what Mary would say. Well, you've escaped death so often by the skin of your teeth. I think you're pretty safe from everything but old age. Presently, James turned to his uncle. I say, this is rotten oil. I wish we could get some fresh. I was just thinking that, well, you're a pal of the cook. Go and ask her for some. There's a good chap. She'll do anything for me, said Major Forsyth, with a self-satisfied smile. It was his opinion that no woman, countess or scullery maid, could resist his fascinations. And taking the cup, he trotted off. James immediately went to the cupboard and took out a cartridge. He slipped it in, rested the butt on the ground, pointed the barrel to his heart, and fired. Epilogue A letter from Mrs. Clibben to General Sir Charles Clough, K.C.B., 8 Gladhorn Terrace, Bath. Dear Charles, I am so glad to hear you are settled in your new house in Bath, and it is most kind to ask us down. I am devoted to Bath. One meets such nice people there, and all one's friends whom one knew centuries ago. It is such a comfort to see how fearfully old they're looking. I don't know whether we can manage to accept your kind invitation, but I must say I should be glad of a change after the truly awful things that have happened here. I have been dreadfully upset all the winter and have had several touches of rheumatism, which is a thing I never suffered from before. I wrote and told you of the sudden and mysterious death of poor James Parsons, a fortnight before he was going to marry my dear Mary. He shot himself accidentally while cleaning a gun, that is to say everyone thinks it was an accident. But I am certain it was nothing of the kind. Ever since the dreadful thing happened six months ago, it has been on my conscience, and I assure you that the whole time I have not slept a wink. My sufferings have been horrible. You will be surprised at the change in me. I am beginning to look like an old woman. I tell you this in strict confidence. I believe he committed suicide. He confessed that he loved me, Charles. Of course, I told him I was old enough to be his mother, but love is blind. When I think of the tragic end of poor Algy Turner, who poisoned himself in India for my sake, I don't know how I shall ever forgive myself. I never gave James the least encouragement, and when he said that he loved me, I was so taken aback that I nearly fainted. I am convinced that he shot himself rather than marry a woman he did not love, and what is more, my daughter. You can imagine my feelings. I have taken care not to breathe a word of this to Reginald, whose gout is making him more irritable every day, or to anyone else, so no one suspects the truth.
but I shall never get over it. I could not bear to think of poor Algy Turner, and now I have on my head as well the blood of James Parsons. They were dear boys, both of them. I think I am the only one who is really sorry for him. If it had been my son who was killed, I should either have gone raving mad or had hysterics for a week. But Mrs. Parsons merely said, The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I cannot help thinking it was rather profane and most unfeeling. I was dreadfully upset, and Mary had to sit up with me for several nights. I don't believe Mary really loved him. I hate to say anything against my own daughter, but I feel bound to tell the truth, and my private opinion is that she loved herself better. She loved her constancy and the good opinion of little Primpton. The fuss the Parsons have made of her, I'm sure, is very bad for anyone. It can't be good for a girl to be given way to so much, and I never really liked the Parsons. They're very good people, of course, but only infantry. I am happy to say that poor Jamie's death was almost instantaneous. When they found him, he said, It was an accident. I didn't know the gun was loaded. Most improbable, I think. It's wonderful how they've all been taken in, but then they didn't know his secret. A few minutes later, just before he died, he said, Tell Mary, she's to marry the curate. If my betrothed had died, nothing would have induced me to marry anybody else. I would have remained an old maid, but so few people have any really nice feeling. Mr. Dryland, the curate, had already proposed to Mary, and she had refused him. He is a pleasant-spoken young man with a rather fine presence, not my ideal at all, but that of course doesn't matter. Well, a month after the funeral, Mary told me that he had asked her again, and she had declined. I think it was very bad taste on his part but Mary said she thought it most noble. It appears that Colonel and Mrs. Parsons both pressed her very much to accept the curate. They said it was Jamie's dying wish, and that his last thought had been for her happiness. There is no doubt that Mr. Dryland is an excellent young man, but if the Parsons had really loved their son, they would never have advised Mary to get married. I think it was most heartless. Well, a few days ago, Mr. Dryland came and told us that he had been appointed vicar of Stone Fairley in Kent. I went to see Mrs. Jackson, the wife of our vicar, and she looked it out in the clergy list. The stipend is three hundred pounds a year, and I am told that there is a good house. Of course, it's not very much, but better than nothing. This morning, Mr. Dryland called and asked for a private interview with Mary. He said he must, of course, leave Little Primpton, and his vicarage would sadly want a mistress, and finally, for the third time, begged her on his bended knees to marry her. He had previously been to the Parsons, and the Colonel sent for Mary, and told her that he hoped she would not refuse Mr. Dryland for their sake, and that they thought it was her duty to marry. The result is that Mary accepted him and is to be married very quietly by special license in a month. The widow of the late incumbent of Stone Fairley moves out in six weeks, so this will give them time for a fortnight's honeymoon before settling down. They think of spending it in Paris. I think, on the whole, it is as good a match as poor Mary could expect to make. The stipend is paid by the ecclesiastical commissioners, which, of course, is much safer than glebe. She is no longer a young girl, and I think it was her last chance. Although she is my own daughter, I cannot help confessing that she is not the sort of girl that wears well. She has always been plain, no one would think she was my daughter, and as time goes on, she will grow plainer. When I was eighteen, my mother's maid used to say, Why, miss, there's many a married woman of thirty who would be proud to have your bust. But our poor dear Mary has no figure. She will do excellently for the wife of a country vicar. She's so fond of giving people advice and of looking after the poor, and it won't matter that she's dowdy. She has no idea of dressing herself, although I've always done my best for her. Mr. Dryland is, of course, in the seventh heaven of delight. He has gone into Tunbridge Wells to get a ring, 
and as an engagement present, has just sent round a complete edition of the works of Mr. Hall Kane. He is evidently generous, I think they will suit one another very well, and I am glad to get my only daughter married. She was always rather a tie on Reginald and me. We are so devoted to one another that a third person has often seemed a little in the way. Although you would not believe it, and we have been married for nearly thirty years, nothing gives us more happiness than to sit holding one another's hands. I have always been sentimental, and I am not ashamed to own it. Reggie is sometimes afraid that I shall get an attack of my rheumatism when we sit out together at night. But I always take care to wrap myself up well, and I invariably make him put a muffler on. Give my kindest regards to your wife, and tell her I hope to see her soon. Yours very sincerely, Clara de Toulville Clibben. The End